So my name is Bob Long. I'm a security engineer here at Intercom. Um, I joined the security team here, which is a pretty small team, about two months ago. Before that, I worked. Um, uh, I managed the developer platform team, so we were the team that kind of um, built and maintained a lot of the features that developers use on top of Intercom. I got into security because, as a consequence of that job, I had to build things like OAuth and SAML and, and SSO and all these different things, and I, I started to. Um, I started to realize that, wow, it's, it's, it's pretty hard to write this stuff securely and uh, there's a lot of things that you need to consider and you basically need to be thinking about all things at all times in order to, to do this stuff properly. And much in the same way that there's a, a cost in having to keep up with you know, how front-end um, development kind of um, moves forward and people innovate and, and things move on, it's the same thing with security. You end up having to keep up and spending a lot of your time keeping an eye on what other people are doing. So eventually it became my full-time job. Um, so security at Intercom um, is, it has some, it's a pretty interesting challenge because, uh, you know, we have a whole bunch of front-end applications now, like our, our main Intercom app. We have uh, this, our Educate site now. We have the Messenger, which you can install on your website. And, and other ones, like we have a developer um, kind of tooling site now. We have lots and lots of back-end services as well. So an innumerable amount of back-end services. Some of them um, are, are exposed to users that you can interact with, and some of them are not. They just run in the background and, and keep, things, keep things working. There's a huge amount of shipping momentum every day. So every day there's new stuff um, going out the door. and um, that's kind of relentless. We don't really, culturally as a company, accept any slowdown. Anything like security or, you know, operational readiness, that, that needs to be incorporated into that, not the other way around. We don't do, um, we don't allow for anything to slow things down. And we've also got a dispersed team. So this company kind of has a split between, main split here in Dublin and in uh, San Francisco. There's a little bit of engineering that goes on in San Francisco, but it's almost all entirely here. And we also have some remote folks, and we have a Chicago office now as well um, with some support folks. So we're, we're kind of spread all over, and the security team is based here. Um, and as I said, it's a small team, um, and there's all this stuff going on. Um, when it comes to rolling out security in an environment like this, um, application security is, is really just one thing. You know, there's, there's things like infrastructural security, there's things like physical security, making sure that offices are safe, um, and there's kind of all of this stuff around compliance and information security and privacy and, and all these kind of higher things. So when you get down into application security um, itself, it's still an extremely broad area and it's still pretty challenging to incorporate a lot of the principles of this into an environment that's moving so fast and has so many things going on at once. So the way I, I kind of approach this problem is I, I think about these different pillars. And these are the ones that were kind of at the top of my head. Um, so I'll just quickly go through them. Static analysis using tools like Code Climate, Breakman, these different tools that just take some code, don't necessarily run it, but try and infer uh, security issues from, from what it reads. We do a lot of auditing and pen testing, so we do a lot of internal auditing, mainly carried out by the security team, where we, we pick something we feel like we want to be slightly more confident on, and we go and we try and figure out if it has any vulnerabilities, which I'll come back to. And, and we also do this, um, we also crowdsource this, so we use um, Bug Crowd to kind of get lots of security researchers looking at Intercom. We also, our team also focuses and what I call kind of secure building blocks. So handing off a project or handing off shipping something or handing off something to intercom developers, something that, that um, m makes the work that they do inherently more secure. So they don't necessarily are always aware, but something just sort of gets leveled up from uh, that point of view. Um, secure coding practices. So we, we have a reasonably static kind of stack of the technologies we use. It changes, obviously, over time, but reasonably static. And we've got a lot of expert knowledge internally about what's 
generally considered safe and what's generally considered not. So something the security team try to do is raise the awareness uh, of what uh, is kind of right and wrong in that kind of environment and to kind of spread some knowledge around. And something we've recently been looking at is dynamic analysis. So using kind of automated scanning type tools like Detectify, running them against our production app and, um, and getting automated reports from them. So I mentioned like these are the pillars I really think about and for me the key uh, is to try and find a really good balance between all of those things uh, ongoing all the time. And that's kind of my philosophy on, on, on how to do this. Um, so I, I kind of want to talk about auditing and pen testing because that's kind of the favorite part of my job. Um, and to understand, to understand this, you really need to understand kind of what a vulnerability is. And to understand what a vulnerability is, your best bet is to kind of learn more about OWASP. So I call it OWASP, I have no idea if you're supposed to sound it out, but um, what this is is the Open Web Application Security something. Uh, yeah, and it, uh, is, it's basically an online community of people who are interested in security trying to collate information about, about web application security. And every so often they release this top 10, which is when they try to reach a consensus of what are the top 10 kind of classifications of vulnerabilities. And you can, you can go and you read, through, read through those. I recommend reading through, through those and kind of having a good grasp on all of them and understanding all of them. So the top three from 2013 was injection. This idea that, um, you know, we, we take input from a user and we very, 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 very frequently inject it into somewhere else. And that place where we inject it often has the place to execute commands. So the kind of classic example of this is SQL injection where um, we take some user input, we insert it somewhere thinking that it's a piece of data and it ends up being executed as a piece of SQL code. The second one is uh, broken authentication and session management. So if you're not completely sure of how sessions work top to bottom uh, in, your, in your web app, I really recommend getting to grips with that because it varies wildly. Even in a Rails app running the same version, it varies like dramatically between thing between different applications, and each of those variations has a lot of different ramifications for security. So it's important to understand that. And finally, uh, XSS, um, which is probably the most uh, probably the most uh, known in this room, um, is a classification of vulnerability. I think it's kind of like a very specific version of injection where what you're injecting is basically JavaScript and you're injecting it into a web page. So um, this is a, a kind of fascinating, a surprisingly fascinating piece of code and it demonstrates what an XSS is. So in this first line, and I'm using the old JavaScript syntax because that's just the way I am, and we, we um, assign this script tag as a variable called email that there's some expectation the developer here has, perhaps, that an email is an email. You know, it's not an unreasonable thing to think, but if it comes from a user, it could be anything. And then we use one of these more unsafe kind of properties or functions in our HTML to assign it to something. And this opens up a whole world of problems because what it means is if a user truly does control what goes in there, they can basically take control over the web browser of anyone who opens that web page. So it's a tiny piece of code, it's a tiny idea, uh, but it's, it's quite, I think it's kind of quite deep philosophically because what's really happening here is that in, in web apps, the division or blur between what's data and what's code is so blurred that no one can tell the difference. They're the same thing. Um, so whenever you're dealing with data, you really need to consider that the fact that your thing that you're dealing with is actually something that potentially could be executed. Um, so what can happen? I mean, it's basically like handing your laptop uh, unlocked over to someone else and, and what can happen is basically just limited by their imagination at that point. So when it comes to auditing and, and pen testing, um, as I mentioned, we use, we do this uh, crowdsource, so we, we constantly have good uh, pen testers 
kind of trying out Intercom, trying out our new products, trying to um, send us good vulnerabilities um, that uh, we can kind of take some of the pressure off ourselves a little bit. But we also do a whole bunch of internal auditing. And um, this is not a, a very complicated procedure. Um, a lot of people will jump straight to installing something like uh, the Burp Suite, which is this huge, um, complicated suite for um, intercepting HTTP requests and, and uh, finding vulnerabilities. The, by and large, the most uh, commonly used tool I use is grep, just searching for different types of code fragments. I use Postman, which is a Chrome extension, and I use the Interceptor extension for Postman, which just lets me see all of the HTTP requests that my, uh, my laptop is making. And I use the Chrome Dev Tools. I'd say that's 90% of the tools that I use day to day when, when hardening. And um, a, like a really easy thing that you can start doing today in your job is start investigating uh, kind of code smells. So uh, in an organization, uh, as time goes on, if you are interested in this stuff, what you can do is start to develop a sort of internal corpus of um, patterns or functions or things that you think uh, are potentially uh, unsafe or basically not safe enough to risk using them. So for us, which uh, by and large we use Ember and we use Rails, are things like uh, HTML safe from Rails. Uh, I think the triple curlies in Ember and, and safe string, um, but more generally the pattern of concatenating HTML together. Uh, we deal with a lot of user input, and we deal with a lot of user input that has to be rich. It has to contain images, uh, links, and, and videos and things. So we can't just restrict things to plain text. We need, we need some way of getting rich content for people. But we've sort of decided as an organization that there are safe ways and there are, are not safe ways to do this. So the good news with a lot of these functions, and there, there are more than this, is that you can start to use static analysis tools like linters and things like code climate to, to start detecting these and start raising them as proper errors that fail. Um, and if you find yourself um, needing them a lot, uh, it's, it might indicate that it's time to start looking at um, kind of those more secure building blocks that I talked about. So going off, uh, taking a step back, investigating why do we need to keep concatenating HTML together and realizing that you're lacking some sort of templating library that you need to either get or you need to build. So that's kind of, when I mentioned that I use grep by and large as the most common tool, grepping for uh, things like HTML safe and a new code base, um, I would say maybe is, is extremely likely to surface some issue. And even if it's not an issue now, it might be an issue in the future. So. These, this kind of internal corpus, I think, is, is very important to, to think about kind of developing. Um, so we should talk about some of these secure building blocks because as a, a front-end oriented kind of group, there's a lot that you can utilize the browser for to, to suddenly just kind of get a quantum leap uh, in security. Um, there's this great tool, uh, securityheaders.io, which you can point at any web page, it's a very basic scanner, reads the response headers, and uh, grades the website from A to F or whatever based on uh, the security headers that are set. And um, this is a pretty easy to use tool. You don't have to understand every single header because you will when it, when it reads the report back to you. Um, but we use it a lot on, for example, if we're adopting a new tool internally, this is the first thing I do. I point this tool at that website and just get an idea you know, A to F, how well they're doing on, on this particular thing, and it serves as a sort of kind of litmus test of how, how the rest of the test is going to do. So CSP is uh, probably the most uh, significant new security header. Um, it's not that new, I think it's like version three or four now. Um, but basically, the idea of CSP, which is content security policy, was to uh, rule out XSS as a as an attack vector. And um, the way it does this is it, it, it makes you write this, this little DSL in this header that describes 
for each different type of, of content that will be on your web page where it's okay for that to come from. So you might be okay with loading images from Google and iframes from uh, Facebook or something and all these different things, but scripts, uh, you can also pinpoint exactly uh, where, you, where you want those to come from. And uh, it's actually gotten, there is worries, uh, I guess internally, that CSP was getting more complicated over time and the more complicated CSP gets, the more likely it is that uh, you can mess it up and if you mess up your CSP headers, then you're, you're suddenly, you lose that whole protection. But in the latest version, it actually looks like there's um, some simplifications that are coming. So it's actually pretty easy to roll out and to start securing the scripts and things that you load on your website. Uh, another one I think that's pretty recent is, is same site. So this is a cookie attribute. Um, and what this is helping to fight is another uh, kind of class of attack that originates from the browser called CSERF, which is uh, cross-site request forgery. And essentially what this is, is a, you visit a malicious website and they initiate a form that points at um, the kind of website they're trying to attack and to do some destructive action. <coughs> so all of the existing CSERF kind of mitigations are around ensuring that all of the requests that a, a web application sees comes from a kind of uh, trusted place. And, and by and large, the most common pattern that most of the web frameworks kind of do for you is this synchronized um, token approach where you have a token injected in every form, injected in every request. But that's super easy to mess up. Constantly happens. Um, where this happens in Rails a whole bunch, if you're familiar with Rails, where someone inherits from the wrong controller and one of the controllers in the kind of long inheritance chain decides to not check this for some reason because of some reason. And then suddenly you have this very, very quiet vulnerability in the wild uh, not that easy to detect, except using something like a, maybe a web scanner or something, um, or just not ever not doing Rails protection against this. But what same site does is tells the browser that uh, this cookie should only ever be included um, when the request is coming from your web page. So this whole kind of class of CSERF, if done correctly, uh, is ruled out, which is great. It means you don't have to worry about it anymore. And uh, I guess finally the one I picked, HSTS, Oh, I can't remember what, exactly what that stands for. Um, but basically what this is, is preventing um, protocol downgrade attacks. So if you accidentally um, allow something in your application to be served over plain text, uh, instead of over an encrypted connection, um, HSTS can inform your browser that no, this, this web page must always be loaded over an encrypted connection or, or it will refuse to do it. And that's, that's kind of how HSTX works. Um, so I talked a little bit about, about secure coding, but again, OWASP have a, a, a really good quick reference guide here. Um, I, I find that, that reading these things, sometimes the risk is that it's almost kind of too easy to read it and agree with it and forget about it, which is why I think all the stuff I just talked about, about actually incorporating this into the process is important. But it's still super, super interesting stuff. And I'd be shocked if you're not kind of nodding your head while you read it. Um, some of the highlights from my perspective, if you're handling data, it needs to be done in a trusted location. That's usually um, on the server. I like to say that, you know, if we're doing some sort of data validation or sanitization, you should keep it as close as possible to where the data is actually used. And this helps you kind of gain confidence that the thing you're, you're doing is actually correct because you can look up and see the sanitization and look down and see where it's actually used. Sometimes this can be like eight or nine classes apart and um, very hard to investigate um, when it's these kind of complicated chains. Um, generally, just be afraid of dynamic functions and user supplied input. So anywhere where you're interpolating kind of a string into some function that basically is executing a command, you need, to, uh, you need to be hyper aware of what's going on there and that exactly what's happening is what you expect. Um, avoid plain text communication between services. I think this is becoming more common when it's kind of in vogue right now to split things out into services. And uh, one of the things that can kind of fall by the wayside with these different services 
is ensuring that the communication between those two services is encrypted. And this is especially important if you're, uh, you have some sort of infrastructure where you're using AWS and you're using some third party thing or something else. So it's actually leaving the data center, going over dodgy routers and everything, and you need to be sure uh, that that's working. And utilizing good crypto. So when I mentioned um, uh, session management is number two in the current OWASP top 10 um, vulnerabilities. Uh, you need to understand the cryptographic details of how your sessions work. I feel strongly about that. Um, I think the default in Rails now is this kind of cookie store idea where there is no server-side state for cookies and it's all based on encryption and ensuring that cookies can't be tampered with, can't be um, decoded and understood is a difficult problem, but it's necessary to understand the basics of uh, the functionalities of various kind of cryptographic libraries. When do you use a HMAC? When do you, you know, um, which hashing function you should use? All these sorts of things are all things that are really beneficial to uh, read about and learn more about, and um, isn't too difficult. So I think it's I think it's good worthwhile. So I think we're just about done, so I'll take any questions if you have any about uh, security or intercom or anything, basically. Any, <coughs> any yep. questions for Bob? Sorry, yeah? Uh, yeah. Hey, great talk. Um, I was just going to ask you, do you have any recommendations around like uh, JWT, like uh, JSON Web Tokens? Any thoughts around that? Yeah, um, we don't use them. Um, I think they're, I think that's Auth0, they introduced that idea. I, I, I'm a fan of them. Um, I guess the way I, I feel about, about it is that in this organization, in this particular organization, we kind of have bigger fish to fry than the, the token mechanism itself. Um, but I think they're a good thing, a good, a good uh, kind of principle and a, a good standard to have for something like that, for sure. Hello there. Uh, you mentioned a lot about uh, web scanners, uh, having a good web scanner and using that to assess the vulnerabilities and so on. So in your opinion or in your day-to-day -day basis, which a web scanner or scanners you do use? Uh, I like Detectify. Um, that's what we use. Um, we evaluated a bunch and, and um, we found that that one, you know, worked the best for us. We liked the reports that it gave, uh, gave, gave us, easy to set up. Uh, so Detectify would be what I would recommend. Um, just one question. If you have to install your code on someone else's website, is there any principles you should follow there? Yeah, so the big one is the, this whole idea of sub-resource integrity of giving the people that you're installing the web, your app into, the ability to verify that the thing that they're dynamically loading is, is structurally correct. So there is actually an emerging standard or a finished one, uh, this whole idea of sub-resource integrity. And we do some of that here where um, the stuff we dis distribute to users, we will get an alarm if that gets tampered with. Um, but there's more that we, can, we could do there and there's more that we will be doing in future um, to give individual clients the ability to verify that themselves. Um, with with all these principles and lists of things that are like good practice, mm -hmm. you're you're kind of just one step away from saying there's a checklist that yeah. you should go from. Yeah. What what is your day to day like? Yeah. Say you come in on a Monday, do you start at the top of the checklist, work your way down, and then start next Monday? Yeah, I mean that what what you just said is the real challenge of the job, in that we can't have a checklist because uh, a checklist would be looked at and, and disregarded because. It just doesn't fit the culture of, of what we're about. And, and we really want this to feel like a natural, um, bottom-up kind of approach to security. We take a list of, we kind of take a list of all the stuff we kind of want to do, prioritize it, and try and ensure that we have a good balance um, in the security team of the things that we're working on. I spend 
I would say about 50% of the day talking to engineers about what they're worried about. And that's the single biggest signal I get about uh, who we should work with next on something. And I find that that's a surprising kind of superpower just generally in life is talking to the actual people involved that uh, you get um, a lot more information than if you're in a room looking at checklists all day trying to, trying to make a decision. Any other questions? No. All right, thanks, Bob. Thank you.